Yeah. Uh, in today's lecture, we are going to cover one of the very important uh, approaches to material synthesis, uh, because this is uh, both uh, having uh, the capability of making high temperature materials uh, in a non-conventional way, but yet it involves a typical wet chemistry route. Um, as you have seen in the previous lecture, there are a portfolio of uh, chemical uh, synthesis available for making wide range of molecules. And in today's lecture, I am going to single out one of the potential uh, uh, preparative route which has been exploited by many many groups and still uh, this uh, particular approach has not been aborted by the researchers because there is lot more novel insights coming out of uh, this particular process called combustion synthesis. And um, this combustion synthesis is specially earmarked for high temperature materials, because the energetics that is involved in this combustion route is actually coming from uh, a chemical synthesis, which achieves very high temperature and uh, therefore, it is possible for us to um, realize uh, materials which are otherwise prepared only at very high temperatures. Uh, now, when I talk about high temperature materials, uh, these are not the usual chemical uh, compounds that we prepare in la uh, lab scale uh, with simple um, uh, hydrolysis or reflexing, because this is the typical uh, chemistry routes which is uh, commonly seen in any wet chemistry lab. But what we are seeing here is we are starting with the wet chemics, chemical approach, but we are realizing very high temperatures as you would see from this cartoon. So, I will just take you through uh, this uh, course of uh, combustion synthesis and tell you what is the principle behind, behind this approach and what are the advantages and what is the chemistry that we learn from this and where do we go from here. <coughs> um, as you would know, uh, when you talk about high temperature and when you talk about combustion, the first thing that comes to your mind is uh, about launching of uh, satellites or spacecrafts. Now, what you see here is um, a launching pad and lot of energy is released to take this uh, uh, space shuttle uh, out of the earth uh, orbit. And uh, this is again uh, what you see in this uh, right side is a Japanese space uh, shuttle which is ready for launching. But the essence of this whole payload to go out of earth's orbit is dependent on whether it is a solid rocket or a liquid rocket. Meaning a solid rocket consists of a solid fuel, uh, uh, fuel as the a combustion material and as a result it can carry the whole space shuttle and put you put it in the outer orbit. Now, what is important in this uh, solid uh, rocket is the solid propellants and uh, solid propellants are nothing but a mixture of fuel and oxidizer and this is the essence of any space applications. Now, uh, the beauty of it is if we understand the principle that governs this launching, then we will know how we can translate that for material synthesis. So, uh, in the first few slides, I will take you through the essence of uh, what a propellant is, what it means to have a fuel and a oxidizer and how we can convert this enormous energy into a controlled energy for making materials. Now, before I go into the details, I, I just uh, single out uh, some of the um, issues related to propulsion. Propulsion can be either solid propulsion or liquid propulsion and many countries have been using this systematically to put their space shuttle in the, uh, in the uh, outer orbit. Now, if you look at India for example, India has attempted many launching space launches of which uh, they have used 19 with solid uh, propellants and 15 with uh, liquid propellants. And out of 19 they have uh, only failed once um, and uh, with liquid propellant it is uh, zero failure and they have, uh, they have done it uh, quite systematically uh, with both solid and liquid propellants. Uh, if you look at uh, USA and uh, um, 
USSR you can see USSR has heavily relied on liquid propulsion for their space launches whereas, uh, US has been using both the techniques um, very judiciously. Uh, Japan for example, if you see uh, they have relied more on uh, solid propellants than the liquid propellants. Now, what is the advantage and why this propellants can become uh, divisive in the space launches? You can see that the energy that this uh, propellants carry is very vital and uh, as a course of time uh, the time evolution of energy is plotted here as uh, early as um, min uh, minus uh, uh, 500 AD or 3500 BC uh, people were using bow and arrow. Now, if you keep on looking how the energy situation has uh, uh, surfaced uh, you can see that uh, from there we have graduated to black powder then to ammonium nitrate then potassium perchlorate and uh, silver fulminate nitro starch so on and uh, somewhere here in this uh, arena where we are now living we have now transposed mostly to RDX which is nothing but a composite. RDX, Cl20, high N all these are basically a polymer composite based propellants which are being used. Now, these are hybrid varieties of propellants that are used in space launches. Now, these are also used for several uh, defense purposes. Now, uh, for, to take a simple definition of a propellant it is a chemical mixture that is burnt in the presence of air to, um, to produce thrust in rockets and it consists of a fuel and a oxidizer. A fuel is a substance which burns when combined with oxygen producing gas for propulsion. So, when you are when you need oxygen to burn a fuel then you resort for a material which can give oxygen within rather than take oxygen from outside. That is why the concept of a oxidizer comes the oxidizer is one which releases ox enough oxygen for the fuel to burn. So, if you have a proper chemistry between this fuel and oxidizer then you can release enormous energy therefore, you can get the thrust that you want. So, an oxidizer in a is an agent that releases oxygen for combination with the fuel the ratio of oxidizer to fuel is called the mixture ratio and uh, in propellant chemistry it is usually called as mixture ratio. Now, we use this word more frequently and call this oxidizer to fuel ratio or O by F ratio. Propellants actually are classified in different ways they need not be solid always we can look at some of the definitions for example, liquid propellants uh, used in rocket uh, applications can be classified into uh, 3 petroleum cryogens and hypergols. Uh, what is important is this hypergolic uh, propellants because they are fuels and oxidizers that ignite spontaneously on contact with each other. When you, when you just bring both the oxidizer and fuel in physical contact immediately they become hypergolic and they get ignited that is the uh, definition of a hypergolic propellant they the easy uh, they are easy st and they start starting capability of the hypergols make them really um, ideal for spacecraft maneuvering therefore hypergolic propellants are much more used nowadays than even petroleum and other cryogens now, what are these hypergolic fuels? Hypergolic fuels are commonly known as uh, uh, hydrazine or monomethyl hydrazine uh, po popularly abbreviated as MMH in rocket technology and uh, hydrazine gives the best performance as a rocket fuel. As you know hydrazine is nothing but uh, uh, N2H4 and this N2H4 can be substituted with methyl groups. So, they are called as unsymmetrical dimethyl um, hydrazine where uh, two methyls can be uh, substituted here and two hydrogens can be here or it can be a monomethyl both are found to be extremely useful hypergolic fuels. The oxidizer in this case is actually nitrogen tetroxide or nitric acid. So, just bring hydrazine and uh, and in contact with nitrogen tetroxide immediately they burn 
to give the necessary heat. Now, how do propel, uh, propulsion uh, occurs or um, how can we uh, propel this combustion principle to make material synthesis is our question because the energy that is released is uncontrollable you just cannot fashion it uh, it can just put uh, a big mass into the space. So, this has to be retained or confined into a lab situation is a big challenge therefore, how do we propel this combustion uh, for material synthesis is a million dollar question and we will look at it. Uh, it is not um, new uh, per se because the principle of combustion for high temperature synthesis has been there for many years and the most uh, important one is the thermite reaction which is nothing but burning aluminum with iron oxide and if you burn it converts into aluminum oxide and iron this is called a thermite process which is usually used in joining or welding railway tracks and this was pioneered by goldsmith in uh, 1898 to prepare metals and alloys. Therefore, this is not a, um, a new phenomena to make materials, but this is often categorized as self propagating high temperature synthesis because um, this has been used to achieve very high energy to prepare new materials. Walton and uh, Paulos prepare have prepared refractory ceramics, ceramics which are usually uh, alumina based or zirconia based ones which are doped with some uh, 3D transition metals. But the concept of uh, self propagating high temperature synthesis was actually exploited more by Mersonova. So, I would like to uh, show his portrait because he was uh, one of the pioneers in this field who brought in a uh, lot of fundamental applications of this SHH uh, technology uh, for applications. Mersonova have used a metal fuel and a non metal oxidizer to prepare borates, carbides, silicides, cermet hydrates and nitrates. If you want to prepare nitrates then you need to mix it with some nitrogen producing um, starting material. If you want to provide borides you have to mix it with the boron uh, elemental boron or diborane or if you want to prepare carbides then you have to uh, mix it with the reactive carbon powder. So, when you try to use a metal and a non oxidizer as fuel you make a mixture of it and then you spark it then you can actually initiate a very high temperature reaction and thereby you can get all this high temperature ceramics. These are otherwise it is impossible for you to prepare in a lab scale um, or we need to use a conventional furnace which is operated at uh, uh, 2200 degree C which can be used for making uh, borides or carbides. So, this is a very versatile uh, uh, process and in the next slide I will show you a small clip uh, of a movie which shows how this uh, high temperature material uh, works and uh, pro Professor Merzenov uh, is actually um, the academician of the uh, Russian Academy of Science and he has authored many journals uh, based on SHS technology. In fact, this process is so very popular that there is a separate journal called International Journal for Self Propagating High, high Temperature Synthesis and it has been there uh, in the shelf for more than 20 years and still many novel approaches are being made using this uh, technology. Uh, this technology also has been used um, to make, uh, make uh, ferrites, uh, ferrite magnets um, useful for uh, industrial application. Uh, Pankhurst and co-workers they have used this uh, uh, process to prepare uh, this sort of uh, ferrite material. What you do here is take um, all the starting materials together like magnesium oxide, zinc oxide, iron, Fe2O3 and potassium perchlorate. Per potassium perchlorate in this case acts as a oxidizer and they form a mixture together and the mixture is actually burnt. The reactions can be started by point source initiation where a hot wire or filament is actually touching a pellet and that will initiate a very high temperature reaction and uh, it can give you um, the final product which is nothing but a ferrite magnet.
Now, the advantage here is if you want you can make it as a disc or a rod or a spiral a ring anything you can make provided you make the shape of it in the precursor and then you try to ignite and uh, start this uh, SHS reaction. Uh, as you can see uh, these are very fast uh, reactions therefore, in 4 seconds you can actually reach temperatures up to 1400 uh, Kelvin. Um, and you can see the span of this reaction is not lasting for more than a minute it is always less than a minute therefore, it is a rapid uh, self propagating one. So, just initiate that is enough you do not need to run through or sustain uh, the reaction by heating it that is why it is called self propagating because once you initiate it can propagate on its own and uh, it can um, complete the reaction. And you can see uh, from this profile by 27 um, uh, seconds all, almost the um, combustion is over and it is cooling back. Uh, this is the uh, IR image infrared image of this uh, zone which clearly shows how the uh, temperature propagation is occurring from a low temperature to high temperature and against uh, each uh, um, time scale 4 second this is how the propagation is 10 second this is how the pro propagation is. So, uh, between 4 to 10 second it almost hits the maximum temperature and then it starts cooling down. Now, this is being conducted also in the absence of field and in the presence of field. For example, uh, the, the same composition has been prepared in using a external magnetic field of say 3 tesla. Okay. So, uh, I have to, uh, uh, I have included this point uh, SHS in large magnetic fields. So, if you take the uh, uh, specimen at 3 tesla and if you take the specimen at 12 tesla you see uh, a much harder and much sintered uh, magnet is formed at a higher temperature. Um, the passage of uh, why because the passage of the wave induces an electrical pulse and a small magnetic field both of which are thought to be caused by the movements of ions and electrons at the molten reactant front and because it generates a electrical pulse and a magnetic field then the external magnetic field can also propagate a wave which can initiate in the soldering or in the sintering process of this final product. So, if you are actually looking for making a fine, uh, fine finishing of, uh, of the preferred form or shape of your ferrite then application of external magnetic field also influences making such materials. So, um, this has been widely exploited um, as uh, SHS, but uh, uh, the word combustion has not been used till then rather it has always been referred to as self propagating high temperature synthesis. <coughs> uh, this is a movie that I want to show just to give you an idea what this self propagation is and how much of energy is involved and how we can initiate such a reaction if you can carefully look at the animation. Uh, so, this clip will uh, help us realize how the uh, combustion can be initiated and what sort of temperatures can be achieved in short time scale and let us look at this movie. So, what we need is uh, a heat uh, oxidizer and a fuel to initiate such a reaction. <coughs> so, the metal complexes we can form are of this nature and this is made into a pellet like this. Yeah, in, in such a short span uh, in less than uh, 2 minutes or so it is possible for us to uh, realize uh, a product as you had seen in the last phase a small pellet can actually give you almost a one uh, uh, 10 centimeter long metal foam 
and this is one of the way this uh, uh, high temperature reaction can be achieved. But also it might look look scary because uh, it is actually kept in a confined uh, 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 medium where it uh, organ is uh, surface through this reaction uh, because you do not want uh, oxide in case of metal forms you have to uh, supply uh, organ atmosphere. But can we make this bit more easier is the question is a open challenge and can we extend this sort of high temperature reaction for many of the other materials other than merely metals and alloys that is the question that we need to understand. So, the point that we need to notice combustion reactions can become explosive in nature if it if the O by F ratio that is the oxidizer to fuel combination is not controlled and if the reaction is not done in an open vessel this can become a potential um, explosive uh, situation. Therefore, we need to be careful uh, to, uh, to control this reaction uh, by doing uh, uh, such experiments in a open vessel. Uh, now, how to tame combustion synthesis to make material uh, is what we are going to see. Um, the one of the option is to use a solution process because as you have seen in the earlier cases it has always been a dry mixture uh, of all the ingredients mixed with the um, oxi powerful oxidizer and when you spark it you get the corresponding um, oxide or metal. But the other possibility is to use a solution process and what is the objective of using a solution combustion reaction number one we can use different metal salts because we do not need to necessarily always start with pure metallic powders which is often very very costly. But if you go for metal salts those are cheaper available easier and you can use it in larger amounts for scale up activities therefore uh, this is one of the prime motive the why we can resort to a solution process. Number 2 when we try to make a quaternary mixture of uh, metals uh, in the final product then you can actually govern or you can hold the stoichiometry together because you can carefully start with stoichiometric uh, amounts of corresponding metal salts. Also this can be a rapid one step synthesis because you do not need to necessarily mix all these solids to bring it into intimate contact because in solution when you bring everything together then they are stoichiometrically and intimate, uh, intimately mixed and as a result the metal ions can be brought to atomic level distances. So, once metal ions in atomic distance and then you initiate a combustion then the final product actually will be um, a purely stoichiometric uh, compound which is desired uh, for us. So, for this reason one can resort to a, a solution process which is a viable alternative to the known uh, SHS uh, technology. So, the person that I would like to uh, highlight and bring to notice is Professor Patil's group at IAC who pioneered this field called solution combustion synthesis and uh, it was such a fascinating discovery um, of making uh, oxide materials that uh, this was the first ever review that was written on the solution combustion synthesis by Professor Patil in Bulletin of Material Science in December 1993. Uh, for those of you who are interested in knowing the history of how this solution process uh, was developed uh, one should read this article therefore, I have quoted this uh, uh, particularly and uh, I also would like to record uh, the uh, other pioneers in this field um, including myself uh, this is uh, Dr. Kingsley who was the first person to publish a uh, PhD thesis on this uh, uh, combustion synthesis and this is a uh, interesting photograph which we took in late uh, in 86 where you can see uh, Kingsley holding uh, a petri dish a glass dish containing uh, alumina powder. I will show this photograph in the next slide 
and this was the first ever result that came out from solution combustion synthesis um, which was developed at IAC Bangalore. Um, now the solution combustion synthesis when developed it can actually result in foamy residue of uh, metal oxide particles for example you can see this is a petri dish which is of 300, nano, uh, 300 ml capacity and in this 300 ml capacity uh, dish you can actually fill the whole dish with powder which will just weigh only 2.72 grams and this can be such a fine um, and porous powder that you can prepare um, which has very high surface area uh, with very low particle size. There is no other method by which one can prepare uh, a compound like alpha alumina which is a high temperature form because when we try to make alpha alumina it is usually a high temperature oxide therefore you have to heat it to very high temperature in a electro heating furnace and in such case you will always end up getting a sintered product which will be um, uh, one hundredth of the volume that it will occupy. So, it is a very very uh, important uh, reaction which was which gives high temperature phase phases with lot of uh, special surface features. The first paper that was published on this solution combustion synthesis uh, was published in materials letters which, uh, which is the pioneering publication made by uh, Kingsley and Patil and as you can see here a list of aluminum based compounds were uh, uh, prepared including magnesium aluminate, calcium aluminate, yttrium aluminum garnet. Uh, zirconia, uh, lanthanum aluminate and including ruby powder uh, have been achieved. Uh, the main feature of that is you can prepare all these compounds by just maintaining a solution at 500 degree C which will get combusted to give this high temperature ceramics. We will look at some of the issues in greater detail in the next few slides. The range of compounds what was published in the first paper include al, uh, alumina and as you know uh, YAG is a laser material and then um, tetragonal zirconia is a, a toughen ceramics and then this is a electrolyte beta alumina and then LaLO3 is a very good uh, uh, precursor material for thin films. So, you could see here vividly that almost all the aluminum based compounds were prepared in the first instance using this combustion procedure. So, what is this combustion? Combustion of a proper combination of an oxidizer and a fuel this can produce the exothermicity required for simultaneous synthesis of oxide ceramic powders. So, when a combustion is generated because of a, a proper combination of an oxidizer and fuel the energy that is released is actually used by a simultaneous formation of the um, metal powders or metal oxide powders and for this reason oxidizers which uh, include metal nitrates um, and uh, the fuels can be urea, carbohydrate, glycine and others have been used successfully as uh, fuels. I will come to this list uh, in greater detail. The metal nitrates are good oxidizers therefore, you can either take a divalent metal or a trivalent, a trivalent metal nitrate um, those which are divalent are magnesium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, strontium, calcium, barium all these uh, have the ability to form nitrates and uh, they are bivalent and uh, trivalent ones are all the lanthanides, uh, uh, lanthanide ions as well as aluminum. So, if you are looking for in fact uh, chromium also can be included because chromium nitrate is also trivalent. So, uh, if you want to prepare chromates then you have to start with chromium nitrate, if you want to prepare aluminates then you have to use aluminum nitrate. Metal perchlorates as a word of caution I want to register here that metal perchlorates although they are oxidizers it they are very very hazardous because they can produce lot of uh, oxygen or oxidizing atmosphere they can produce. But what happens is uh, when you try to do a combustion 
the perchlorates can actually transform uh, into metal acides in combination with the fuel and therefore, they can behave as explosives even on a lab scale. Therefore, caution has to be taken that there should be no reference to making metal perchlorates as oxidizers when you do combustion for making material synthesis. Organic fuels uh, particularly those containing nitrogen also serve as a complexant in the precursor which inhibits inhomogeneous precipitation. Therefore, any uh, fuel that you are taking if they are rich in nitrogen they will invariably prevent uh, complexation as, as a result when you add a fuel to a metal um, nitrate solution there would not be precipitation rather it will form a clear liquid. Therefore, the organic fuels that are preferred are those which have more number of nitrogen and they also participate in a effective combustion reaction. So, uh, such organic fuels are uh, needed the predominant ones are hydrocytes, but uh, do we really need a hydrocytes as I told you in the initial part of my lecture that uh, hydrocytes monomethyl dimethyl uh, hydrazine these are used as propellants, but we do not really need to resort to hydrazine what we can do is we can even start with a simplest of um, such uh, uh, molecules organic fuels as uh, simple as urea. Urea as we know is not considered to be a fuel it is considered to be a good fertilizer otherwise, but um, from the propellant chemistry principle we can observe that even urea can play a role. Why? Because on oxidative decomposition urea will actually go out as either as ammonia and uh, carbon dioxide or they will go as nitrogen and hydrogen and carbon dioxide upon complete combustion. So, urea is a very good uh, uh, fuel plus it does not leave any residue as impurity. The simplest uh, uh, other one uh, other than urea is glycine I will show some examples of how uh, this should be actually C H um, 2 uh, this is glycine and then you have uh, carbohydroside and then you have malic dihydroside all these sort of hydrocytes are simple um, ammonia based uh, uh, organic molecules can be used for, uh, for the combustion as fuels. Combustion methods are particularly well suited to producing multi component metal oxides yielding compositionally homogeneous fine particles with low impurity content. This is the speciality of this wet chemical uh, route. The exothermic uh, redox decomposition of this oxidizer fuel mixtures is actually initiated at low temperatures usually less than 250 degrees C as you would see from another animation that it is very easy for us to prepare such high temperature materials using a wet uh, chemical um, uh, combustion procedure where you just initiate the reaction with as low as 250 to 500 degree C. Now, in a regular protocol for a solution combustion synthesis it is very easy um, because uh, in step 1 all that you need to do is take a proper combination of a fuel and oxidizer and make a homogeneous solution in a beaker such as this. This is a glass beaker and you, you have to take very minimum amount of water and not excess amount because when the reaction is occurring sometimes the fuel can be destroyed uh, on uh, when it goes through a long heating time. Therefore, we need to have a minimum amount of water just to dissolve both the oxidizer and fuel and once you insert it into a furnace then you see a typical uh, combustion reaction such as this happening and after the combustion reaction the solution is actually co converted to a product and uh, this is a example of preparing ceria doped with platinum uh, example I will quote in the uh, slides to follow. So, uh, what is the time scale from the time you make the solution and you get this product uh, after inserting it through a through a furnace the whole thing takes less than 2 minutes. So, in 2 minutes time you can achieve such a high temperature reaction. Uh, this is a um, movie which I want to show before I touch upon the issues related to combustion synthesis. So, I just want you to watch this movie what you see here is 
um, a muffled furnace a open muffled, muffled furnace and this furnace is actually maintained at 500 degree C. So, what you, you can do instead of taking a petri dish you can even use a 250 or 500 ml beaker and take the solution and put it inside a preheated furnace and then you would see the sort of reaction that is happening. So, as you see uh, you have the oxidizer and uh, the fuel which is uh, going through complete dehydration uh, and the excess water is actually coming out as you are heating it. The first few uh, in, uh, seconds you can see some sort of a frothing that is happening and after that this combustion reaction occurs. During the combustion you can actually see how the um, wave propagation is the exothermicity is actually propagating from the top downwards and as and when the uh, reaction is uh, the temperature is used for converting that solution mixture into oxide then the oxide is coming out and then the uh, propagation is actually going down. And once this is done you can see that the ruby powder that is uh, formed is uh, uh, is coming out and you can see the uh, pinkish tinge in this uh, uh, in the solid product and if you take uh, the pl of for this uh, ruby powder you can see the excitation spectra and the emission spectra exactly matches with that of a ruby crystal and as you know uh, ruby crystal is nothing but uh, a laser material which is used for making ruby lasers and they show a, a characteristic emission uh, around a 695 nanometer. So, if you get such a sharp emission peak then you can be sure that it is actually a lasing action that is coming from ruby powder and this ruby powder incidentally can be prepared from mixing one uh, less than 1 percent of chromium nitrate in aluminum nitrate. So, whatever that is coming out is not alumina powder, but it is actually uh, ruby powder that is chromium atomically doped in the aluminum sites of aluminum oxide. So, this is a fabulous reaction where such uh, low level impurities can be very nicely incorporated into alumina matrix. This is, uh, uh, this is not the only uh, compound we can make n number of compounds uh, uh, out of uh, such approach uh, all you need to do is depending on the end stoichiometry we need to take the corresponding metal nitrates to prepare such oxides. Properties of these products are therefore, uh, influenced they are influenced by the nature uh, of the fuel and the oxidizer fuel ratio many technologically important oxide ceramics can be produced by this method. So, I will try to take you through few examples to show you how the fuel content is important and uh, what is the relevance of this oxidizer fuel ratio and how do you calculate this oxidizer fuel ratio to make such combinations. The key, key principle in combustion reaction is the efficiency and uh, this efficiency of combustion is actually calculated by the oxidizer to fuel ratio which is given as Q e uh, or phi e we can call it is nothing but a summation of the coefficient of oxidizing elements in the specific formula uh, into valency over minus 1 into a sum of coefficient of reducing elements in the specific formula into valency. Therefore, if you have uh, your metal nitrates you can actually calculate the oxidizing valency in the numerator and if you have a fuel then you can calculate the reducing valency of your uh, organic fuels um, based on their valency. So, accordingly a stoichiometric proportion of this reactants should yield uh, q by e should be equal to 1. If q by e is equal to 1 then you can say then the combustion efficiency will be at its maximum, but there is a case when if the fuel uh, uh, effic the efficiency is less than 1 that means, it is a fuel lean composition meaning there is more oxidizer though. So, you need to 
lower down on the oxidizer uh, uh, proportion and there is a fuel rich case when the uh, phi E is less than 1. So, both this has to be avoided um, and preferably it is always better to take a fully stoichiometric uh, situation, but then uh, when you are actually taking metals, metals in the initial phase during the combustion can get reduced to metallic metal which can also catalyze the combustion therefore, the exothermicity can be more. In such cases always it is better to play down with a fuel lean mixtures than fuel rich mixtures. So, depending on the type of reaction that you are aiming you need to fine tune on the oxidizer to fuel ratio. Uh, for example, let us take the case of barium hexafluoride which is one of a uh, one of the compound and the barium hexafluoride has a composition Ba Mg2 Al 16 O 27 and this barium hexafluoride can be prepared using urea and if you want to balance this equation for a complete combustion this is how it looks uh, like where you take 45 uh, moles of uh, this barium nitrate, magnesium nitrate, aluminum nitrate to give barium magnesium aluminate uh, sorry th this should be barium hexa aluminate. I am sorry about it this is barium hexa aluminate, but what you should understand is during complete combustion you will have 90 moles of water which is released and this uh, water will actually go as the initial step in the decomposition process before the combustion occurs, but when the combustion occurs you actually have 45 moles theoretically possible 45 moles of carbon dioxide and 72 moles of nitrogen that is released upon complete uh, combustion and this is one of the important features of the solution combustion process because it is a gas releasing exercise. Enormous amount of gases are released as a result the final residue will always be a porous and a um, finely divided metal oxide. If this much amount of gas is not released then it will be a highly sintered compact. So, if you want to prepare nano dimension stuff then you should actually favor a solution combustion process because of the gas evolution it gives a highly reactive solid and as you saw from the movie the, the whole process is actually occurring in less than 1 minute time and the, uh, <coughs> the gases which are trapped is the ones which are hypergolic which is giving this high temperature and because of this gases which are released during the combustion they are not sintering the particles. Another thing the whole reaction is also uh, run in a beaker in a glass beaker it is uh, a phenomenal uh, reaction because um, even though such high temperatures above 1000 degrees are achieved yet we are not seeing the glass melting and this glass is not melting even at very high temperatures because the energy that is released during the combustion is actually dissipated or flushed out by the escaping gases number 1 and the uh, reaction mixture is also consuming this energy to transform into the corresponding oxide product. As a result even though you are using a glass vessel with very high temperature the glass does not melt at all because it is a fast quenching. Uh, technique. So, uh, one of the things that we need to understand is that uh, when we try to take a mixture of metal nitrate and fuel in this case the calculated ratio as far as the oxidizer fuel ratio is concerned has to be 2.36. So, when you control this fuel to oxidizer ratio then it will be possible for us to control the exothermicity of the reaction. Now, we can also play around with different uh, compositions or different combinations for example, the fuel to oxidizer ratio can vary with the sort of the reducing valencies of the fuel and in this case urea if you take urea then um, for the energy to be maximum this is the dictated formula fuel to oxidizer ratio, but if you, you can also play around with this 3 or with 1 
which is a fuel uh, lean is situation in such cases you will see the efficiency will vary and it will not be equal to 1. Now, if you go for um, carbohydrate you see um, for the fuel efficiency to be 1 in this case the fuel to oxidation ratio has to be 1.78 whereas in this case um, uh, for urea it was 2.36 that is because the number of reducing valencies in carbohydrate is different from the number of reducing valencies in uh, urea. I will give you one more example of how uh, this fuel ratios can influence. For example, you take the barium um, hexa aluminate which is doped with urea. If you take the fuel to oxidizer ratio at 3 or if you take fuel to oxidizer ratio at uh, 2.36 you can see the change in the crystallinity. This is according to the OBF ratio, but this is not according to the OBF ratio as a result you can clearly see the crystallinity of the end product is varying. So, this is um, proving very cru crucial and uh, again uh, in this example you can uh, find out that you if you vary the fuel to oxidizer ratio depending on whether it is a fuel rich or fuel lean or stoichiometric you can see that there is an enormous change in the crystallinity for the same composition. So, the oxidizer to fuel ratio is very very critical uh, in this example and you, uh, once you make that you can clearly see that the commercially available uh, barium hexa aluminate uh, is almost similar to the features of uh, combustion derived powders. So, we can uh, make commercially uh, viable uh, synthesis if we can scale it up uh, uh, to proper proportion. Uh, we can also see in this profile the relative intensities of this uh, barium hexa aluminate doped with europium. Um, you can see the uh, depending on the oxidizer to fuel ratio either using urea or carbohydrate the P L is drastically changing for this phosphor. So, we have to optimize which is the proper uh, stoichiometry for getting the right type of uh, um, uh, property that we desire. This is another example of uh, what are all the important phosphors that can be prepared using the combustion synthesis as you know um, yttrium silicate doped with the ceria. Uh, can be used for uh, scintillators application. We have strontium aluminate doped with europium for long lasting phosphorescence material strontium aluminate with uh, dysprosium uh, terbium. Then we have europium activated uh, activated LaLO3 as red phosphorus. Um, we also have yttria doped with europium as uh, red phosphor in uh, uh, CRT uh, tubes so on. So, a uh, host of phosphors can be prepared using this combustion synthesis. Here is another example of how with the doping concentration of terbium in yttrium aluminum garnet one can change the luminescence of uh, uh, the uh, resulting powder using uh, combustion synthesis and these are all the YAG powders which are activated at 254 nanometer excitation. Now, I will give one example of how crucial the oxidizer can play the role effect of oxidizer on the combustion characteristics. This is a, a paper which appeared in 2010. I just picked out this paper because uh, even now people are uh, experimenting on making nano sized uh, iron oxides. Uh, this has appeared in International Journal of uh, self propagating high temperature synthesis. Uh, although it is nearly 24 years since this process was devised still lot of activity is going on. Uh, I am just going to point out to you the use of uh, ferric nitrate and ferric oxalate. Ferric oxalate is used as a oxidizer um, in one hand and ferric nitrate is also used as a oxidizer where glycine has been used as the fuel. Uh, in both cases glycine is used, but because we do not have nitrate here uh, extra nitrate is used in the form of ammonium nitrate. Suppose I do not have a metal nitrate then we do not have to worry about it you can take a salt 
um, of that particular metal and you can compensate for the combustion reaction to occur by taking ammonium nitrate separately that is also possible. So, if I take this combination or if I take this combination you can see how the uh, property varies uh, as you see here uh, this is the TGDT uh, for both this uh, combinations. If you take uh, iron oxalate ammonium nitrate and glycine together the exothermic decomposition is occurring somewhere around 182 degree C. Whereas, if you take metal nitrate iron nitrate with the uh, uh, glycine you can see uh, phenomenally the, uh, the combustion reaction occurs at a very uh, early stages. Uh, there is a difference of around 40 degrees um, if you take metal nitrate compared to iron oxalate. So, the starting material can actually play a important role in the combustion not only that the uh, resulting powders also determine the quality of sample that you can see. If you take iron nitrate as starting material with glycine look at the porosity here uh, 100 nan uh, micron or uh, 40 micron the enlarged version you can see so much of porosity on the metallic oxide foams that are produced and this porosity will determine the surface area also. Whereas, if you take iron oxalate and ammonium nitrate separately then you can see that hardly there is any porosity and it is all well centered. Therefore, this iron oxide what you get, get here will be um, more centered and less surface area material compared to the other one. And you can also see the uh, morphology of the iron oxide powders uh, starting with the uh, <coughs> oxalate and uh, uh, nitrate. Uh, so, distinctly it alters the uh, surface properties. Now, the effect of combustion synthesis on uh, the metal oxide composition. I will now show you some example of the systems. Uh, so, far we have seen the effect of fuel and oxidizer. Now, I will tell you what all we can achieve out of such combustion reaction. We do not have to exactly make uh, metals alone or oxides alone we can also make composite materials. Uh, th this example I have already shown you the reaction is nothing but doping platinum in ceria or cerium oxide titanium oxide composites. Why they are used because these are very powerful auto exhaust catalysts ceria impregnated with uh, um, platinum or ceria uh, uh, platinum doped with the TiO2 is used as a automobile excess catalyst. But what you see here uh, after some cycle this uh, catalytic converters are dead they are poisoned because of the um, uh, outcoming uh, excess as a result uh, the efficiency goes down. But if you use combustion reaction you can see uh, the activity is enhanced to a greater order the mechanistic pathway for such reaction is given here where your carbon dioxide is coming getting adsorbed with the molecular oxygen and you can see there is a competing interaction uh, on the surface and then the uh, carbon monoxide goes as carbon dioxide and it cleaves uh, cleaves out and this is the mechanistic pathway. But what makes this combustion process interesting is that unlike the other cases where you try to prepare alumina with platinum or platinum with ceria or platinum with the titania they are all surface adsorbed. So, the noble metals will actually do the catalytic process with the host material almost as a mute spectator. But in the combustion process you can see that the platinum, cerium, uh, palladium everything is actually doped they are not as uh, zero valent metals, but they are here as ions. Once they are substituted effectively into this host lattice then the conversion process of carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide is 15 to 20 times faster than the conventional rea reactions. As you can see here this is a profile of uh, carbon dioxide formation as a, um, a function of temperature. If you just take ceria without doping then this is the conversion profile, but once you dope just with the 2 percent of palladium you can see the shift in the 
uh, in the temperature range and the way it is so highly selective the conversion is very very selective and it is much faster mainly because palladium is not actually sitting on this area, but it is actually doped into the uh, <coughs> lattice and palladium actually goes to palladium 2 plus and cerium, cerium 4 plus goes to cerium 3 plus and therefore, it is now more as a substituted uh, uh, catalyst rather than a composite. As a result, you see a remarkable uh, conversion of CO to CO2 and this can easily replace all the noble metal catalysts in today's automotive industry. Similarly, you can also see just 1 percent of palladium that is doped into TaO2 can actually push the conversion even to near to room temperature. So, if you use this uh, 1 percent palladium doped TaO2 you can see the conversion as low as 50 degree C at 50 you can convert all the carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. Why uh, this is useful because the combustion route has a peculiar uh, way of pushing the noble metal into the lattice and because they are sitting inside the lattice the uh, the way the uh, conversion of CO to CO2 to, uh, CO to CO2 goes is very very facile. Uh, we can also try to impregnate this catalyst uh, onto this sort of cardiorite monoliths this is typically the way the excess uh, catalysts are embedded in the converters you can uniformly coat it and make it a useful catalyst bed we can go for several such catalysts to get this uh, <coughs> done and uh, similarly we can make uh, composites of uh, ZRO2 and uh, CO2 uh, ZRO2 several such composites can be made uh, of which um, alumina, ceria, yttria, uh, zirconia you can see all these powders which are known to show surface area less than 1, gra uh, one uh, meter square per gram can show such a very high porosity and high surface area. Now, uh, just two three slides I will try to uh, wind up to show that uh, there are other ways to initiate this combustion other than merely uh, using a furnace. So, I call this as furnace less combustion synthesis which is actually microwave ignited. If you do not have a furnace you can use a simple kitchen microwave to initiate this process advantages you are generating the heat from within the solution mixture rather than heating from outside and you can clearly see that in this the the, uh, uh, the mass also plays a role instead of using a conventional synthesis you can use a microwave synthesis and in 2 gram quantity this is the way the crystalline magnesium aluminate is formed but when you use 100 gram quantity you can get a crystalline form this is one reaction and I, I can show you another example. Uh, this is another uh, thing that is happening uh, which is of interest where combustion reactions are uh, experimented in microgravity therefore, for space um, <coughs> applications uh, you need to study uh, at zero gravity how this combustion proceeds and uh, NASA is particularly taking this as a uh, active program to consider how combustion synthesis can occur at uh, zero gravity or microgravity and uh, this combustion reaction can also be used for making a real to real uh, impregnation of this nano powders uh, into several uh, layers coatings. So, this is not only done in uh, lab scale, but this can be done also in a um, <coughs> industrial level. Lastly, I just want to conclude that uh, this is uh, this combustion process has gone uh, into many spheres now it is being referred uh, with many um, names uh, it is called popularly wet combustion route uh, some people call this as materials born out of fire and uh, this is also referred to as furnace less combustion and instant combustion synthesis. So, there is lot of potential for many more interesting physical and chemical properties to be studied using this simple combustion technique.